Good morning. How are you all? All right? Survived the season? Yes? Do you feel that you have applied a few pounds in all the wrong places? Yes? Apparently, on Steve Wright in the afternoon yesterday, it's a really, really good thing to have put on a few pounds because apparently it helps you fight infection. How about that? This is a really good thing, but I suppose if you go into a doctor's surgery and the doctor then prescribes four times a day, three glasses of Bailey's, half a pound of Quality Street, it's going to be a really good thing. So it's all good. I know that I've taken in my kilo of Quality Street this year and I've probably got a kilo of it sitting on my ass, so we're going to be uh, getting rid of that. So Christmas is now out of the way and now we need to think about getting some business in and starting the new year the right way. How many of you actually have your financial year starting on the 1st of January? Who's doing, I mean, your financial year? Some of you then, yeah? The rest of you, your financial year is around, is it around April? Do you do the April thing? Right, okay. You don't, Sam? No? So some people are staggered. Mine isn't either. But a lot of people tend to have them at very, very specific times. And then what they do is they then think about their sales, sales strategy or their business plan. And what we've got to do is, as it is the new year, it's about getting that impetus going to be able to get in more business and fill that pipeline. So I'm going to give you some, just some top line tips and tricks that will help you to get off on the right foot this year. And there's some, just some slides, and they're not text heavy. I don't do the text heavy stuff. So there are a lot of images, and this is being recorded for you as well. So you can then download it, and you can get stuff too. I've brought along with me a couple of books that I think, and I, I tend to always do this, because I think you should definitely read around the subject of sales. There's a lot of rubbish out there. There really is. And there's a lot of recycled stuff that you, know, you just think, that's not real. That, that doesn't work. Um, Barry here seems to buy every book that I recommend. And yesterday has had a carpenter in to build a new bookcase. So that's marvelous. I think you need to do a bit of commission there. Morning. Hello. So um, this book came out a couple of years ago. And it's called The Only Sales Guide You Will Ever Need. It's by a guy called Anthony Iannarino. I don't know if I pronounced that right. He brought this book out, and it really does cover all of the fundamental principles that you need within an entire sales process. And it works really, really well. He says this is the only book that you ever need, and yet, <laughs> very recently, he brought out another one called The Book of Closing. So I don't know what he's trying to say there. But that book just on the skills of closing techniques is phenomenal and really good. There aren't many books out there on closing skills themselves, so I definitely think that this one is one you might want to consider. Insight selling is all about selling if you are not comfortable with selling. If you're the type of person that doesn't like anything that I'm going to be talking about, channeling the inner wolf, being hungry for the money and all of that stuff, if that doesn't sit overly comfortable with you, that's fine, but you do have to make a bit of money. This approach tends to focus on the fact that you have to resonate with your client, you've got to differentiate yourself, and you've got to back up your claims and substantiate yourself. If you do all of those three things, you will minimize the impact of sales objections and get where you want to be a bit quicker. This has some fantastic stuff on it. And if you go to my website, there is a blog on there called The Power of Three, and that focuses on the content of this book. And it's really, really good. Because I know when I'm selling, the areas where I'm not getting the business or if things don't go awry, then usually it's down to one of those three principles that I've mentioned. So this is definitely something you might want to think about. And you may have seen recently um, on Facebook, are any of you members of Alison's Entrepreneurs Clan Clan? Any members on there? Um, Warren Cass is a member on there, and he recently wrote this book, Influence. There is a lot of stuff on influence that's out there. Probably the most powerful is the stuff by Robert Caldini. That's the stuff that everyone really em emulates, his principal science of influence. This one has come out amongst a raft of others, and it stands out well above a lot of the others. And it's really straightforward, easy to use, and it just makes really good sense. So I think this is a really good book for you to get hold of as well. As I say to a lot of people when it comes to buying books, always buy them secondhand. Don't buy them brand new if you can help it. And if it says contains writing in the, in the borders or it's got highlighting, it means that someone else has read through all the crap, so you don't have to. And you can get to the good bits really quick. The authors won't like me saying that, but at the end of the day, <laughs> we've got to find the punny somewhere, haven't we? So let's have a look at sales then. Let's have a look at sales in a little bit more detail. So when you actually sell something, it is an amazing feeling, isn't it? 
Don't you just love it when somebody signs that contract and all that work comes in? It's a fantastic feeling. And then if you've got that real sales hunger about you, you then realize that you've got to do an awful lot of work then to make it happen and realize that actual sale. But if you're really hungry for the sale and you're really hungry for getting in new business, it can really drive you and keep you going. And that you can't beat the feeling is really, really true. However, one of the things that we have to remember is that within sales, Timing is really, really important. For those of you that have been on any of these before, you'll know that I gave a set of statistics that says that only 2% of sales happen on the first call. Only 2% of sales. Why do you think that is? Yes, I'm asking you questions. They don't trust you at that point. They don't trust you at that point, or they do trust you? They don't trust you, but if 2% of sales, must, something must be right. Why else does it happen? because they're not ready to buy, or they are ready to buy. Could be, could be. 2% of sales happen on the first call because the timing is spot on. And funnily enough, when you're selling, clients tell you that. They'll say, you're really, it's uncanny that you're in front of us at this time. Your timing is spot on. We were only just talking about changing a supplier a couple of weeks ago, or we were only looking at someone like you recently. And then it's almost like the planets are all aligned. And you have to jump on that opportunity because it's almost like being given a referral because the timing is right, so you've got to make sure that you get every single thing in place right there and then so you get that sale, which will count for the 2%. But the majority of sales are made after the 10th or 15th, 10 to 15 contacts. And that means you've got to be persistent and you've got to keep going because if you forget to call someone or you think I'm just being too pushy, well, the chances are that your client that you're talking to is not really thinking the same as you because they've got other priorities. You're not their number one priority. They're thinking about other things. So try and put yourself in the buyer's position. And I always say to people, and Sam, you'll remember this from the early days, we say that people buy from people that they trust, they like, and they believe in. People also buy from people who will help make them money rather than just take money off of them. Traditional sales approaches have been about salespeople only talking and thinking about their targets because that's what drives them. But if you change that thinking to think, how can I make my customers more money with the service or product that I offer, then as such, those clients will make you money without even thinking about it. Does that make sense? So we've got to change the way that we think about it by thinking like a buyer, thinking about their priorities. So when you get up in the morning and you go out to work and you go into a pitch or you go to a presentation or you go to a tender, you need to be going in with that mindset that says, how can I help this person make more money? And at the same time, thinking, I am definitely going to sell you some web design, some accounting, or in my case, I'm definitely going to sell you some training. It gets you in the right frame of mind. Timing is absolutely everything. Just to qualify that extra point, I've brought along with me a selection of food that you are probably sick to the back teeth of. <laughs> you know, nice, nice matchmaker, anybody? Box of milk tray, maybe a few mince pies. You know, <sighs> we just don't want them now, do we? And yet, less than 10 days ago, we were all over this like a dog on hot chips. <laughs> feel like, go on, have another go. Yeah, we'll dip those matchmakers in Baileys. That's what we're gonna do. But right now, we don't want it. But only 10 days has passed. And it's amazing that when you're talking to a client, you can miss the boat that quickly. And if you go and pitch to a client, and then you let them go cold after you've pitched them or sent a proposal, they're basically going to end up viewing you if you leave it too long, just like you view these products. Because you'll go, I'm not interested in them anymore, because it's all gone cold. So you want to make sure that when you send a proposal to a client for work, or you go and present to a client, you always follow up no more than 48 hours later. 48 hours is the absolute. If nothing else, you are ringing in to check whether they have received that pitch okay and whether they have any questions. When you send a proposal to a client, you should include within that proposal the expiry date of the proposal. So the costs that I am quoting you right now are valid until this date. If you don't put that in, if that client holds on to that and doesn't buy from you then, they might come back to you in 18 months and they will hold you to the original prices, which means it's difficult for you to get your price up. 
So what you do is you create a sell-by date on your proposal. On top of that, what you also do is you tell them in the proposal, under a section called what happens now, you tell them what you're going to do as a result of them seeing that proposal. And that means you're going to say to them, I will be calling you within the next 48 hours to find out if you have any questions. I will then follow up a week later. So you manage their expectations. So that when you do call them and get in touch, actually they're expecting your call. They know it's happening. So therefore it doesn't feel pushy. It doesn't feel forced. They actually like that. They like that contact. And never forget that there are some clients out there who genuinely want to realize, you know, are you worth my money? Do you actually want my money enough? And if you want their money enough and you can demonstrate that you're going to work hard for them, then as such, they'll give you their money. But you've got to work for it. They're not just going to give it to you. So we have to be thinking about that. So we have to channel, and I know that some of you have heard me talk about this before, you have to channel this inner wolf. And I firmly believe, and I've been training salespeople for years, and I've been working in sales myself for a long time. I've sold all sorts of different things. But remember I said to you earlier that it is all about having that hunger, that kind of energy where you think, I really, really want to go out and help you, and I want to sell, I want to do it. It doesn't mean I want to turn into a car salesman or a double glazing salesman or what's that comedy series we've got in the moment called White Gold, which is a really you know, a parody of all the double glazing salesmen. But we really want to be hungry for it because that's what keeps us going. And we've got a whole wolf mechanism that we use as a whole wolf sales process that I've created that will help you. But paramount to that is the concept within the wolf mechanism that everyone you meet is potential prey. P-R-E-Y. Because prey stands for people who will have a positive response enough to be engaged enough to say yes. And that's what you want, isn't it? Don't you want people to be positively engaged with what you've got, to be really happy with what you've got so that they say yes? That's what you want, isn't it? Because if they're going to say no to you, then you ain't got anything. So you have to view people as potential prospects. So as you're meeting people here today, it's probably a really good idea to get up and actually talk to people and say hello to people that you haven't met before. Wish them Happy New Year. Go ahead and do it. You can still do the Happy New Year thing this week. It's only next week when it starts to get a bit tiring. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know all those emails that you get from people selling you stuff and they open up going, Happy New Year! And you know, oh, please, no. I'm probably saying something a bit controversial there. It's like, you miserable sod. But, you know, it does get a bit wearing, doesn't it? Anyway, we have to channel this wolf. And there's lots of stuff. If any of you came to the networking one that we did, morning, welcome, come on in. If any of you came to the networking one, we talk about the inner wolf a little bit more. And a copy of that is on the... Glove Factory Studios website. You might want to have a look at that one as well around networking. So we have to think about sales in terms of our pipeline as well. What are your forward bookings like? What's your business looking like as you go through the year? How much business have you got coming in? For many people, they work in a reactive industry where they work hand to mouth. They take a bit of work, they stop, then they pitch for the next bit. But how much are you planning for in the future? So we need to be able to always look out for lots of different people who are potentially people we would want to do business with. And that means you might want to scour the likes of LinkedIn, you want to scour the likes of Zing as well, and use those particular social media channels because they are incredibly powerful and work really well. Um, I've only recently discovered in the last six months Zing. Have any of you used Zing or on Zing? Um, Zing is the social media channel that's like LinkedIn, but it covers a lot of Europe um, and also Asia. So if you're trying to get clients and you do remote work for them where you don't need to see them, you can use Zing. And it works, it's exactly the same as LinkedIn, Z-I-N-G, and it's set up exactly the same. It has a news feed you can post on it, and it works really well. But a lot of people will say, no, I'm not on LinkedIn, I'm actually on Zing. And you think, oh, okay, fine. So have a little look at that. But you'll be able to get pipeline leads from those. And the good thing as well with, with getting pipeline leads is that using those things, you'll always have a name for you to reach out to. So it's not good enough anymore to ring somebody up and say, can I speak to the person who deals with the purchasing of accounts or deals with the purchasing of web design? It's not good enough to do that anymore because you will probably be met with a response that says, are they expecting your call? in which case you ain't really gonna get through and you make it a little harder for yourself, unless of course the timing's right. But if you can get a name, then get that name and use the name when you ring up. 
yeah? And then when you actually get through to them, tell them who you are, who you've worked for, and tell them that you've had success or you've done other stuff within similar businesses and how you'd like to be able to talk to them to potentially help make them money, save them time, whichever, using your product. And how would we best go about, go about having that conversation? It works really well. So having a pipeline is important in terms of leads, but we also want to have a pipeline in terms of business as well. So we know we've got that security. So just out of interest, there are some of you that work for other companies. How many people here are self-employed or business owners? Nothing like that security, is there, of knowing you've got business coming in? Nothing like that feeling. It's fantastic. And sometimes you can create a rod for your own back, and you can get too much work comes it come in. Well, you know, that's a nice problem to have. It really is. But you need to be able to make sure that you've got this pipeline of leads. And I tend to use a little bit of a, a methodology with this. And I look at people in terms of whether they are HPP, which is what would stand for a high potential prospect. I then look at people who are an MPP, a medium potential prospect, and an LPP is a low potential prospect. But what I do to qualify this is I talk about terms in how they are qualified to do business with me. So first of all, are they technically qualified to do business with Serial Trainer 7 Limited? And that means, do they actually have money to spend on training? Are they actually a person or a business that wants to develop their teams? And how do they go about doing that? Have they done it before? Have they got knowledge of what I do? And as such, if they've got that, then potentially they are technically qualified to do business with me. If we go to the next one, this is where we've got someone who will be stakeholder qualified. And stakeholder qualified means you are talking to the right person. Sometimes you will talk to someone about your business and what you offer, and you'll find out later on down the line that you're actually not talking to the decision maker at all. You're actually talking to someone who's been asked to find out about businesses like yours, in which case they are not stakeholder qualified. They're not the right person. So you've got to make sure that you're dealing with the right person, and if you're not, that you're feeding the right amount of information so that it does go to the correct stakeholder. And lastly, we want to be talking about whether they are fit to do business with you. Not fit as in really good looking. We don't want to do business that way. That's not healthy or appropriate. But what we want to do, <laughs> what we want to do is we want to find out whether the client that we're dealing with is easy to work with or whether they are very hard to work with. And against those two, if they're easy to work with, are they a high profit client or a low profit client? And if they're hard to work with, are they going to make us work for our money, in which case they could be quite demanding and difficult to work for, but the returns are worth it, or are they going to be a high profit client and very easy to work with? Some clients pay you a lot of money and you don't have to do anything for it, really, do you? It's marvellous. It's brilliant. It's like having your own Big Mac. So what we've got is we then have, if we then think about these, we have what we would call the nine frame stakeholder matrix. And it would mean that whilst you're trying to look at all your list of potential leads that you're dealing with, you just attach this to it and you would just put ticks in a box. So they are very technically qualified, which is great. I am dealing with the right person and potentially they could be quite hard to work with, but they are going to be, you know, quite a high profit person. So you just put ticks in each box so that you know where they are and you apply it to your notes. If you get clients which are potentially sitting in all three of those like that, then you should be looking to close those down a lot quicker. Whereas if you've got ticks in these three, maybe the sale is going to take a bit longer or something is a bit out of whack. If it's down here, this doesn't mean no, it probably just means not now. So the chances are this is where you have to just keep in touch and this is where the persistence bit pays. Does that make sense? Yeah? So it's a way of managing your prospects in a little bit more of a strategic way. And when it comes to you going back to a bank manager to ask them for more money for your business, you can actually present that to a bank manager to say, this is the validity and viability of the market that I'm operating in, and this is why I need more money. And it works really well, and they tend to, they tend to like that. So your pipeline is really important. And we talk about the bank manager, we have to think about the bank manager, because actually, if you were to read a business plan that the banks put out, and you can get them online all the time, just download them, 
If you look at the questions that a bank manager asks you in order for you to get money from the bank, funnily enough, they're the exact same questions that you ask a client in order for them to give you their money to do business with them. Things like, what's unique about your business? Where is your business coming from? Where are your clients coming from? Why should clients buy from you rather than anyone else? Who else is in the marketplace? And when you look at those questions, it's almost like you've got an entire list of sales questions already in front of you, ready to be primed and used for your clients. It's already there. But if you just think like your bank manager, and if you can convince your bank manager to give you money, then ultimately you can convince clients who are in the right frame of mind or in the right market for your product to give them your money. Yeah? So think in those terms. We want to be able to have a networking plan. Of course we do. Have you got a networking strategy in place right now? Do you know the events that you're going to be going to throughout the year? Have you got them all mapped out? Lots of companies, just like Glove Factory Studios, are really good at promoting different events and opportunities for you. There are lots and lots of networking places you can go to, and a lot of the networking social media stuff is really, really good as well. Alison Edgar's um, Clan Clan is really very, very good. Very high quality people that are in there, good people. Um, sometimes you will go to networking groups and networking events where you are asked to pay for membership and bring a number of referrals with you to each meeting. Um, as much as I think that's marvellous and referrals are great, I'd probably be very wary because it makes you feel a bit pushy and it puts you under pressure and I think that negates the whole thing of networking a little bit. If you've got a genuine referral, then give it, but I wouldn't want to be forced into doing it because you don't know people and it's your reputation. So you have to think about that. So tread carefully on some of those. Um, some of them have a good reputation, some of them don't. Just research comments about what's going on. And if you're unsure, always ask to attend event as a test. Can I just come along and try it out? Um, if they say, no, you can't, we want you to pay for it, I would steer away from it. They should be able to let you attend. So it's no problem. But make sure you've got a networking plan. Go to expos, do those things. I have found personally, and this is just me, guys, that exhibiting at expos has been kind of beneficial, but the problem for me is that I'm actually stood there rooted to the spot in one place and I can't go anywhere. And what I like to do at an expo is I like to kind of work the room and get around and meet people and talk to people. So as such, I find it much better to actually attend and walk around with a load of business cards and stuff. They like giving you away chocolates and sweets at these places. Of course they do. But there's no reason why you can't take a bag. <laughs> Offer up. It makes it look a bit dodgy. You know, strangers in candy, people. <laughs> strangers have the best candy. Anyway, we want to be able to think about the leads that you're generating as well and where your leads come from. You can get companies who will sell you leads if you want them, and you can get companies that will sell you databases of leads if you want to go down that route. It's a fantastic way to get business if you want it, but you will get a certain amount of wastage, and you want to look at certain agencies who are very good at doing that. But actually, I think there's a lot of merit in going out and finding your own leads, going to networking, getting them, and using this matrix to work out whether they are hot, medium, or cold. I like this guy very much. This is a guy called Don Shula. Don Shula was the coach for the Miami Dolphins. And uh, some of you might have heard of a book that came out a few years ago by Ken Blanchard called The One Minute Manager. Heard of that? Fantastic book. Really, really good. Really stands the test of time. He also has brought out recently The One Minute Coach. And it's written in association with Don Shula. And there's a lot of really good stuff in there. It talks a lot about American football and all of that stuff and baseball. It does all of that. But one of the things that comes out is this guy's incredible thinking. He's absolutely brilliant. But what he says is that often you get some people who say to themselves, I am going to aim for this. So in one example, he says, we want to aim for excellence. So we are going to aim for the dartboard. So I'm going to get my dart and I'm going to aim for the dartboard. What Don Shula says is that if you aim for the dartboard and you watch people who play darts and they're actually aiming just to get on the dartboard, they often miss. They often miss and the dart falls on the floor or worse, it'll hit someone else in the eye. But actually what he says is don't aim for the dartboard, always aim for the bullseye. Because if you always aim for the bullseye, you'll always hit the dartboard. Funny that, isn't it? It kind of makes sense. That actually you'll always come away with something if you aim for the bullseye. 
And I really like that. That kind of makes me think, actually, I can be a bit more specific. So the reason I like that is because, I know I'm moving around again, this poor cameraman, he hates it when I come here. He does, was wandering around. So this is where, when it comes to selling, you want to be able to create your own bullseye. So you always come away with something. And this is what we call your win. So when you go into a sales meeting or you create a proposal or you talk to someone on the phone, create this first of all. This stands for your want, your intend, and your need. This is your need. This is the absolute essential thing that you have to have as a result of that meeting. And that could be that someone will say to you, yes, could you put a proposal together? We're very interested in seeing what you're doing. Or that they're going to invite you back to pitch and present to another group. Or that they're going to book with you. It just depends. But you need to have an absolute minimum criteria so that at least you come away with something. At the very top is the want. This is the dream. This is the stuff that will make all the magic happen. So this is where you say, actually, I want a sale. So this is the bullseye. This is the bullseye. This is the bit you've got to aim for. But if you always have your want and your need in place, you're going to come away with something. The intend is the next best thing. And this is where maybe the timing isn't right just now. However, what is going to happen is there is going to be another process. Something else will happen, and you'll be happy to come away with this. So when you think about it, planning your call, if you plan it properly, you can create outcomes for yourself where you come away not thinking, well, that was a complete waste of time. They're just screwing me over. They're just playing a game. You actually come away with something, and it feels more constructive. Even if they don't book with you, at least you've made a new friend. At least you've made a new contact. Potentially, they could be. And this has happened to me where I've gone in and pitched to someone, and I've come away thinking, well, that's really good. I'm going to send them some information. And you know deep down inside you go, they're never going to buy anything. They're never going to buy anything. And then three or four months later, the phone rings, and someone says, hello, you don't know me, but you know this person. And you spoke to them, and they said it was a really good idea for me to call you because we're looking for some training, and you talk to them about it. And you rack your brains and you think, I don't remember. Oh, yeah, I do remember. They didn't actually book anything, but they've referred me. So I did something right. And as such, when I look back through my notes and I look back over this win, I can see that actually I thought it through a little bit more. So clearly I gave them a little bit more, and that meant that they came back. So that's quite a nice thing to be able to do. So put that together for each of your pitches. And as Don Shula says, aim for the bullseye, don't aim for the dartboard. Seems to make sense. You need to know your client universe as well. You need to know the market that you operate in. You need to see where you fit, where you fit. And one of the ways that you will do this is to map your clients in terms of where you're getting and made up, where your client universe rather is made up of your regular clients, your non-regular clients, clients who really have already got stuffed going with you, and then cold clients. Cold clients, of course, are those clients that you have either never spoken to or potentially that someone else has used, but they haven't used you, but what they're doing is they're looking to change, or potentially someone who you've had a bit of a dispute with, and you might have let them go cold. So what we want to do within our client universe is know how big this marketplace is and to be able to say to ourselves, I'd like my cold clients eventually to go to either existing or I'd be happy for them to be going non-running or I'd be happy to them become regular clients. My non-regular clients, I'd like them to become more regular. And my existing clients, well, where are they going to go? Where do your existing clients go? Hmm? They stay where they are. We'd love that. Or they could become regular. But here's the dark news, guys. They go somewhere else. They go somewhere else. Because we've all, you, you know, you're not going to have a lifelong relationship with these people unless you're very lucky. And as such, there is a, a shelf life that you might have, no matter how good you are. As a trainer, I had a client a few years ago who said to me, every trainer has got a deck of cards that they play. And once they've expired that, there's nowhere else for them to go. And that really resonated with me because that made me realize that this client thinks that I've only got a very limited shelf life. 
So it made me work even harder for them so that actually I could deliver more and more and more and become more relevant. Oh, on that word, I'm just going to digress slightly. Never say you're different. Everyone says they're different. Everyone. So as a recruitment agent, never say that you're different because you do things like we filter all the CVs and do all that because that's what everybody's saying. Everybody says all that stuff. Don't say different, say relevant. And then tell them why you're relevant. If you can justify why you're relevant, they'll listen because every single person is hearing different. When I used to have people sell to me, I used to hear the word different. And when they said the word different, I heard the word dross. And it was true. Because actually, if you're relevant, you'll be able to say, I can help you make more money. But funnily enough, they never said that to me. And that was all I was interested in, was them helping me make money and run the business. So what we've got to do is we've got to look to these cold clients here, and we've got to keep topping up the pot. Keep topping up the pot. Know where we are, and know how we're going to go and get our business. And that's where we use this pipeline deal here, where we start prospecting and using it effectively. Really important is not to complicate things. Don't complicate it, don't make it hard. Go for the stuff that's really, really easy to get to. When I first set up my business, I had come from media, I'd worked for Future in Bath for a long time. And as such, it was very easy for me to go for what was called the low hanging fruit because I could just go to all the other media houses. And all those media houses knew who I was. So as such, they realized that all the training that we had such a great reputation for, they could get some of. So suddenly it was very easy. And then when you start to find other things that are quite easy and relevant, you go after that stuff as well. And then you start to build on it. And over a period of time, you start to get referrals in. But there's definitely a pattern that happens with your referrals as well. Because after a while, you will have people initially that will refer you who have never used you or they've had experience of you. But sometimes you will end up with your own clients referring you to their clients. And when they do that, I would probably say that that's the golden goose, without a doubt. So you don't screw that relationship up and you really, really work hard. They almost become a high priority client and beyond some because it's not just your reputation, it's actually your client's reputation because they've referred you and that makes you think very strategically. But ultimately, it's about going for the really easy, relevant stuff first. Don't make it hard for yourself. Really go for the easy stuff. And sometimes it seems too easy and you think that's too easy. But no, go for it. You've got to keep your cash flow going. It's really important. Five a day. This is my golden rule. Five a day. Five a day. Not the fruit and veg. No. Yeah, well, we do a bit of that, although you wouldn't think it. But there we are. Five a day. Five calls a day. Five cold calls a day. Or don't call them cold calls. Call them introductory calls. When you use them, call them cold calls, it has a kind of a, a word, doesn't it? It kind of makes you feel uncomfortable because it's cold calling. It's a bit like the word gatekeeper. We don't like that. Alison Edgar, who is a fellow sales trainer like me, we both hate this word gatekeeper. And she did this whole thing on her site where she said, don't call them gatekeepers because they're not. They're just good people. They're great people. They're just doing their job. Befriend them. Be nice to them. They could have the ear of the buyer. And I've been in a situation where I've been a gatekeeper. And I've had people who have tendered for business. And I've looked at some of them and gone, do you know what? What you've got is absolutely brilliant, but I just don't like you. So when it comes to talking to the person who's asked me to look out for it, they'll go, oh, well, this company looks really good. I think we should go with them. And you go, yeah, they're really good. But you know what? The person I dealt with was a complete ass. They really upset me. They were really rude. And that person's going to go, oh, well, don't worry. We'll find someone else. We don't want to deal with that. So if you're going to be short with these people and you're not going to look after them, you could lose business. So don't think just because you're not talking to the right person that ultimately that can't lead to something. So that's why we use that matrix. But make sure you do five calls a day. Ever since I've had my business, I do five introductory calls a day. I want to talk to five new people a day. Every day, regardless of where it is. And that's not emailing them first. When you sell, don't email first. Always call first. If you email first, they will do to your email what you would do to theirs, which is where you hit the button called delete. <laughs> or as some other people call it, fuck off. Go away. That's what we want. That's what you do, isn't it? So that's that button. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that you are doing five introductory calls a day. And that's not a lot to ask. If you don't do them one day, then you know you've got to do the 10 the next day. But you'll know it's going to be really easy because you would have created a pipeline of leads for you to talk to people. And if you feel that you're not in the mood to talk to those people, then go back and talk to people in your pipeline you've spoken to before. But at least keep practicing. 
As a sales trainer, I often get people who say to me, those people who can sell, sell, those people who can't train. And that really irks me. And I've seen a lot of sales trainers who don't sell themselves, but actually have people who sell for them. And I wouldn't want someone like that training salespeople for me. I sell every single day. And I can't train people to sell if I don't do it. And I don't live out of a textbook. I live in the real world because I'm doing it every day, just like you are. And that gives huge relevance. And that's what you want to be able to do. You want to be able to get in front of your clients and talk to them every day. Spread yourself around. People, product, process. This is an ultimate thing when it comes to business. And you need to focus on these three things when you're selling. Focus on the people you're dealing with, focus on the product they sell, and focus on a good sales process. The one that I favor more than anything else would be, Sam, what's, the, uh, what's our sales process? Desire, action. It's one of them, without a doubt. It's one of them. It's a really important one. Ada, attention, interest, desire, action. The other one we use, PCMC. Probe, confirm, match, close. It's a four-stage process broken down very easily into the phases of finding out and showing how. Probing, questioning, confirming, showing that you've listened, matching, selling your product, closing, asking for the business. Really very, very straightforward. One of the problems that a lot of salespeople have is that they go into their particular client and they start talking about themselves before they start talking about the client. And that really rubs people the wrong way because people like to talk about themselves. And as such, you should always go in giving them a little bit of an interesting hook, if you will, about yourself and what you've done. And then to say, enough of that. I'm really here to find out about you. And I've got some questions and some things I want, I've got I've brought for you. Some people will know that you're going to question them. And some people get a bit bored with that. And you can detect that very quickly. So one of the things that I like to do is to bring what I would call a piece of insight about their market to the conversation. And that might mean I might read around their subject or something on LinkedIn. But if you can bring a piece of insight, you can ultimately tell them something about their business that might surprise them. If you were to go to a solicitor to buy a divorce or to buy conveyancing or to buy a will, let me ask you this. Would you think that that law firm is going to be expensive? Would you think that there would be quite a price attached to any of those things? Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? You'd go in with that assumption. If you go and use the expertise of a lawyer, would you expect the lawyer to tell you what to do? Yes, you would. You would, wouldn't you? You're looking for them to tell you what to do. But here's the thing, right? Lawyers are salespeople because they bill by the hour. The reason they're there is to make the business money, but they don't call themselves salespeople. They are, but they, they don't dress it up as that. And we expect them to tell us things. We expect them to charge a, fortune for, charge a fortune for it. So what you want to do when you are going into your client is to think the value that you offer. Don't undervalue what you have and go in at a decent price. Think about commanding a premium, but also go in with a bit of insight or a piece of information that might help them. Give something away. Don't just interrogate them. Give something away. Talk about other people that you've dealt with in a similar market and the experiences they have if, of course, you haven't signed an NDA. So be careful on that. So just make sure that you share information without naming names, if possible, but say your experience of working in a market. It plays a real role, and it creates even more of that magical relevance. So as it says here, life is like a camera. Focus on what's important, but don't get knocked back every time you get a knockback. Don't focus on the negatives all the time. Develop from the negatives. Actually learn from them. You know, it doesn't matter who stands in front of you. There's no perfect salesperson. I screw it up all the time. But at the end of the day, you know, people are people, aren't they? We have to treat everyone as individuals. So as such, learn from those negatives. Don't let them drag you down. Just because you get a bad experience with one person who says no doesn't mean everyone is going to say no. So try and learn from that. And be the energy that you want to attract. Be that positive energy. Get out of bed and be really happy about the fact that most of you are self-employed. And that's really good, because if you don't make any money, you don't have a business. And if you don't have a business, guys, that means you have to go back and be employed again. Who wants that? <laughs> <sighs> no, once you set your own business, that's it, isn't it? It's a really freeing feeling. But we have to fuel the beast. We have to keep it going. So be that energy. Make sure that you are delivering on that. 
And lastly, think about making this year the best year that you've ever had. So the best of last year, and this is what I genuinely wish for you, the best of last year, make sure that the best of last year is the worst of this year for you. And that way, you will end up with a really positive mindset and you will start thinking that ultimately, you can grow your pipeline, you can actually start having a bit of a strategy when you're talking to your clients, and you can use a process. I would definitely invite you to go onto the Serial Trainer 7 website and download as many notes, blogs as you want that are there on sales. There are so many of them, are so many of them. One of the things I really would recommend for you as well is there is a blog that I've put up around New Year's resolutions called Willpower, your new, new superpower. And willpower is important when it comes to selling. You've got to keep going, you've got to create the habit. So read that, get some stuff from it. Guys, if you have any other questions, feel free to email me direct. Um, so simon at serialtrainer7.com um, or connect on any of the social media profiles. I'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much. Very much.